Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about Hepworth Wood sculptures from my conservator's viewpoint and about a couple of the opportunities I think there are for, for further research. And let's see. Okay. Well, we could start by identifying the woods themselves to be sure we know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, we need to know this so as to address a less recognised problem, which is the gradual structural deterioration that occurs as these woods age. Hepworth knew well enough that wood responds to changes in humidity, but she probably didn't foresee the cumulative effects of decades of cycles of small expansions and contractions. Um, wood is resilient, and up to a point, it can swell and then shrink back a little. But it can be strained to cracking point by conflicting changes, and that is when you get uneven expansion and contraction. We need to know how the woods used in the actual sculptures respond to changes in their moisture content and how we can anticipate and prevent strain and strain uh, on the vulnerable parts of the sculptures so as to avoid failure. And by failure, I mean you know, irreversible cracks and splitting. I tried to, uh, to count how many woods... I haven't tried, rather, to count how many wood sculptures Hepworth carved, although Sophie says it would be easy to look at her database. Um, but I did jot this list down in no particular order of the woods she is listed as having used. And they may not all be different. For example, um, basswood and lindenwood, uh, they're both lime. Um, Hepworth says she preferred the resistance of tropical hardwoods, which make up more than half the list, but these were impossible to source during the war years and soon after. And I see a mist of uh, paddock, which was used in the uh, Dissinetron, and I'm sure there are others. But it's a huge number. I've highlighted the elms. I thought elm was elm and that these three uh, names were simply descriptive names of the same species, but I was wrong. Cornish elm, grey elm and broadleaf elm are actually different wood species, presumably with, similarly, with similar, but similar but slightly different characteristics. Do these look, woods look and behave differently from other elm species, such as, for example, the English elm? Are they perhaps misnamed? Until recently, we've had to be content with visual identification of a wood by its uh, colour, grain and, and pore patterns. But concerns over illegal logging and uh, the lack of genetic diversity among trees has led to the development of DNA testing and that's now capable of identifying a species and going far beyond that down to identifying timber from the same tree. Uh, so that's a, a direction for future research. Um, this is, it's a very staged studio photo, this, but nonetheless interesting. Um, I like the way she says the Himalayan rosewood, which I found through friends in Devonshire, had a kind of jungle-like ferocity. Um, it's, it's romanticising a very uh, hard and long process of carving, um, but she sort of gives personality to the wood and dyad, dryad, the form that is uh, in the centre there, is now in Edinburgh. Uh, she also says about the, the Cosden head on the, on the left, that it proved to be a singularly intractable metamorphic rock. Now in Edinburgh. So cracks are inevitable, and I think by 1971, uh, they would have started to show in almost all her wood sculptures. Hollow form 
had its cracks neatly filled by, by Dickon Nance, one of um, <coughs> Duckworth's studio assistants, and he used slivers of elm wood. It, uh, I think that was done at when or soon before it was gifted to the Tate. And a couple of years later, Hepworth was asking uh, Norman Reed how the fills were actually standing up. She did mine about cracks. There's a detail, and it's, I think you can see down the center there, the, the sliver of elm that Nance uh, inserted. Nowadays, it's a collaborative decision uh, amongst between curators and conservators as whether to fill to attempt to fill a split or or leave it. Um, hopefully, they're guided by the sensible principle of only doing uh, as much as is necessary and as little as possible. I don't really mind the cracks in the wood. But the real enemy of wood is, of course, central heating. Hepworth's correct. That's the nature of wood. And at present, I think the, the Tate's loan policy, for example, asks between uh, uh, 40 to 60 percent RH in the room and no more than a plus or minus 10 percent change in 24 hours. It's pretty standard. Um, but there are always pressures to reduce energy costs and to loosen the rules. So my question is, what sort of stability is really needed? Uh, could the rules be more flexible or should they be more stringent? And I'll come back to this in a moment. The Palais, across the road from the museum in, in St Ives, uh, I thought this was a relatively recent photo until I blew it up and realised that's Hepworth in the background there um, with a mallet on, her, on a stool. But it basically didn't change for at least 30, maybe 40 years. Um, after Barbara's death, her family opened the studio to visitors and gifted it with many of her sculptures to the Tate Gallery in, in 1980. And that was a catalyst for establishing a sculpture conservation section at the Tate, and that's where I started back in 1984. The Palais doesn't have uh, and never had, as far as I know, central heating. It remained as a store for many of her works held by the estate. The mild co coastal situation uh, means high relative humidity, 85 to 90 percent year round, and the woods had become acclimatized to these conditions. It put them at risk of splitting when displayed in normal heated gallery conditions. And to meet the demand for loans for the estate's large wooden sculptures, we attempted to reacclimatize some of them very gradually by lowering the RH in uh, makeshift polythene tents over, I'd have to say, several months. And I think that's um, river form there and a uh, figure in walnuts about to be encased. There's a dehumidifier which we sort of gradually brought the RH down over, over quite a long time. Um, but it was guesswork. And to be honest, it remains guesswork. We don't know how much change a wood sculpture can really tolerate in its moisture content change before mechanical damage occurs. And because cut timber is hygroscopic, it's moisture content is closely related to the amount of moisture in the air, relative humidity in relation to temperature. Moisture content varies by species as well and is unevenly distributed within the wood. It can take several years for cut timber's moisture content to equilibrate with the surroundings and the thicker the log, the longer it takes. You always have to have a graph in a conservation tool. Um, and this one, which was done on some um, new test pieces, actually confirms what we've sort of worked with, that, that round, when wood is acc acclimatised to around about 50%, it tolerates further changes best. That's the yellow area at the bo bottom there. But beyond that, bigger changes cause irreversible damage. Now, this was just done with a wood that we 
I think it was red oak or something, and it was certainly not aged wood. It was not in any way typical of any of the sculptures we're, we're thinking about. We know the figures for stress tests on pieces under experimental conditions, and they confirm the general museum guidelines. Unfortunately, different woods, different shapes, different finishes all affect moisture loss and gain, and the cum cum cumulative effect of daily and seasonal cycling is become, becoming apparent on some of these sculptures. It's subtle, but as bonds between individual fibres are weakened, they disrupt the surface finish and the outer smoothness that, uh, that Hepworth so valued. And a seated figure here, which I was looking at a few weeks ago in Paris, I noticed the, um, the little details like on the, on the right arm that uh, where, the sculpt, where the surface is just um, erupting slightly. Uh, that may be to do with shellac finish on the wood, but you know, it, these are slight changes, which, okay, it's um, nine, nearly 90 years old, but you know, it's gonna get older and it's gonna carry on changing. A way forward might be to a, it might be more applied research using, for example, uh, acoustic emission and uh, technology and strain gauges. These are sort of sophisticated baby alarms. Um, it's a way of monitoring individual pieces so that we can anticipate change before they happen. And I think we're all familiar with the creaking of wood in old buildings or boats. And on a micro level, this happens whenever stress is applied to any solid material, but especially a complex one like wood. It's possible to monitor the sound of micro movement as wood fibers strain. And put crudely, a gentle murmur is okay, but if it rises towards a scream, then damage is imminent. Once the sensitivity of a sculpture has been characterized, we could have much more confidence in specifying its safe display conditions, and they might be broader than we expect. So to sum up, each piece of wood is unique and made more so by turning it into a uniquely shaped sculpture. That's a challenge for conservators because the starting point of any conservation operation is to understand the material, what it is, and what its properties are. So identify and characterize, that would be a start. Thank you.